Good day, Mr. Arlinghouse. It is time for your favorite class. Try not to be too frightening here. And for my favorite beverage. So let's begin today. I want to show you something, Mr. Arlinghouse. You know, one time you said that you that I made more money than you. Well, here is proof that that is true. Who's the wealthy guy now, huh? Yeah. You read that? How's your German, Mr. Arlinghouse? $100,000 or Deutschmark. I'm sorry. 100,000 Deutschmarks. Now you're saying, what does that have to do with today's lesson? Well, actually, it has everything to do with today's lesson because this, Mr. Arlinghouse, is a Deutschmark of the Weimar Republic. Yeah. Yes, notice I had it laminated, didn't know anything happened to it. I mean, because. I think tomorrow I'm going to go cash it in and retire. What do you think? Hmm? What's that? Why my Republic no longer redeems these? Yeah. Oh, well. So, let's talk, shall we, about money and inflation uh, in the Weimar Republic. Oh, what was I asking? There we go, Mr. Arlinghouse. It's here, it's here, it's here, it's... Uh, I knew I had it a minute ago, Mr. Arlinghouse. Where is that? We are here. We're here, yes. Inflation brought on the major crisis of this era, 1923, in fact, borrowing to finance the war and the continued post-war deficit uh, spending generated a rise in prices. The value of German currency fell to 64 Deutschmarks to one versus the American dollar as compared to 4.2 Deutschmarks to one in 1914. The French invasion of the Ruhr, where the French went in, as you remember, to collect the to collect their missed payment. The uh, French invaded the Ruhr and just simply began taking stuff, taking coal, iron ore, those kind of things. Sent prices spiraling. There was a strike in the Ruhr, so there was a reduction of productivity and therefore a drain on tax revenues for the Treasury. By November of 1923, an American dollar was worth more than 800 million marks. Forgive me again, Mr. House. And we're back. And yes, that picture I wanted to show you, this one. Yes, this one, Mr. Arlinghouse. Those are German children playing with stacks of the same... I don't know if they're the same amount, but basically German currency of the, the era. The uh, inflation uh, in Germany now, perhaps Mr. Arlinghouse and myself, we understand inflation. Perhaps our students don't. Inflation simply means that there's too much currency in circulation. And that's what happened here, obviously. Obviously, if children can use stacks of money as toys, uh, that money is probably not worth a whole lot. And so getting back to that statistic, um, yes, by November of 1923, an American dollar was worth more than 800 million Deutschmarks. Stores would not accept the currency and farmers uh, withheld their produce uh, instead of selling it. The results of this rapid inflation were staggering. Middle class savings, government pensions, which were set, insurance policies were wiped out, as were investments in government bonds. Debts and mortgages, though, could be easily paid off. Speculators in land, in real estate, and in the industry made great fortunes. Farmers did well because uh, instead of selling for currency, they bartered. 
However, to the middle and lower classes, this inflation was a catastrophe. Coming on the heels of the war, the treaty and these people wanted order restored at practically any cost. All right. So let's talk about that guy, Adolf Hitler. The most notorious figure of the 20th century. Um, you know, uh, although once again, I still think that Stalin and Mao Zedong gives this guy a run for his money. But because he was on the other side during the war and he's so easy to villainize, uh, yeah, he gets the number one ranking. He, Hitler, had a rather wandering youth. He was the son of an Austrian paper hanger. In Vienna, he became acquainted with the Christian Social Party, which had anti-Semitic leanings, which in Europe, that was not uncommon. Please, once again, keep in mind that anti-Semitism throughout Europe is a thing. In 1920, he became associated with the uh, National, German so uh, National Social German Workers Party, the NDSAP, the National Socialist, and, which, yeah, the Nazis. It issued a platform known as the 25 Points, which called for the repudiation of the Versailles Treaty. Every German wanted that. Repudiation of the Versailles Treaty. Oh, I see. Should be just... Unification of Germany and Austria, exclusion of Jews from German citizenship, agrarian reforms, the prohibition of land speculation, confiscation of war profits, state administration of the giant cartels, that means state ownership of the large businesses. Uh, it didn't mean, no, no, not ownership, not ownership, state administration of the large businesses. The owners would own the businesses, but the uh, government of, in this 25 points would administer, direct the build, the businesses, and replacement of large department stores with small retail shops. The Nazis redefined the word socialism to reflect a nationalist outlook, the national socialist. The socialism that Hitler defined was not state ownership of the means of production, but the subordination of all economic enterprise to the welfare of the nation. Uh, the party appealed to virtually any economic group that was experiencing pressure and instability. They, the Nazis, found support, of course, amongst the war veterans who felt that, you know, all their efforts had been, you know, for naught. The SA, which stands for... Storm up Thailand. Or stormtroopers were organized under the leadership of Ernst Ruhn. Uh, I've also seen that spelled. Nope. I've also seen that spelled. O with the umlaut O. Uh, and the brown shirts. Now, yeah, those guys. They were basically, the brown shirts were really like our uh, militia groups that you see now in the United States, the Aryan Brotherhood. In fact, you see a lot of uh, militia groups in the United States today wearing, guess what, brown shirts. And that's not a coincidence. The SA, the Storm of Town, was the chief instrument of Nazi intimidation. They, uh, during this period of time, were a law unto themselves. The existence of such a small private army in the Weimar Republic showed the potential for violence in this republic. And it was quite true. There were several groups that um, kept their own private armies. The socialists and the communists also organized paramilitary organizations. The French occupation of the Ruhr and the German inflation gave the Nazis the opportunity to oppose the Weimar Republic. Because of his oratorical skills, remember radio in the 20s was a thing. It was the new media. And somebody who could speak could go on radio 
and talk to the entire country. Because of his oratorical skills, he was skills, he was a great speaker, and his organizational ability, Hitler personally dominated the Nazi Party. On November the 9th, 1923, Hitler and some of his followers, accompanied by the old World War I General uh, Ludendorff, attempted a coup in Munich. The so-called Beer Hall Putsch. Yes, in Munich. Uh, 16 Nazis were killed. Hitler was wounded, in fact, and both were tried for treason. Ludendorff, because, of course, he was this great World War I hero, was acquitted. Uh, Hitler, however, was sentenced to five years in prison. Hitler used this incident as a way to gain national prominence. He was sent, sentenced to five years in prison, but paroled after only a few months. It was during this imprisonment he wrote the famous book, Mein Kampf, which all you German people out there know means my struggle. My struggle, Mr. Allinghouse, is to find more of these. <clears throat> anyway, the book, of course, advocated anti-Semitism, but also, here's another word for us, Mr. Allinghouse, the German desire for Lebensraum, living space. You say, what does that mean? Well, it all, it's all part of Hitler's Aryanism. Uh, once again, it goes back to that belief that 25,000 years ago, a group of people called Aryans had once lived in Central Asia before they all split up, and then many of them ended up, and this is historical fact, ended up in Northern Europe, and to be honest, in England. And Hitler believed that these were the most superior race on Earth, just like the... Uh, Japanese believed they were the most superior, they were the, the divine race on earth, just like the English said at one time, they were the divine race on earth, etc., etc., etc. But uh, Hitler theorized and made, you know, a compelling case for it to certain people that since this is the divine race on earth, the divine race on earth, the master race, the superior race, needs space, extra space. We're not just talking about Germany here. We're talking about uh, the flat lands of Poland and the Ukraine. Uh, nice, flat, rolling fields, good for growing grain. And I mean, see, that was part of the master plan to take over that area and to move Germans into that area. And those groups who were living there, the Slavs, um, they're just going to have to move somewhere else. Yeah. But what if they object, you say, Mr. Arlinghouse? Well, if they object, then they are to be dealt with. So, Hitler's natural targets uh, were the Jews, uh, gypsies, And the successor states, the newly created states, you know, from the Austrian and German empires, uh, and of course, Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union, and any groups within Germany that opposed Hitler's vision of national unity and purpose. During his imprisonment, he made two observations. Number one, he came to see himself as the leader who could transform Germany from a position of weakness to a position of strength. And, and that the party he learned at the or at the beer hall push where he was imprisoned, that the party, the Nazi party, must pursue power by legal means. In other words, they must get into the government through an election. In other parts of Germany, officials were trying to repair the damage from the inflation, like Gustav Stresemann who was primarily responsible for the reconstruction of the Republic and for giving it some self-confidence. 
He, Striesma, was chancellor from August to November 1923. He abandoned the policy of passive resistance in the Ruhr, as Germany could simply not afford losing that much tax revenue. You say, what does that mean? Well, remember, the old German government just told the workers in the Ruhr to quit working. Well, that's a nice idea, and it denies the French what they were trying to get, but it also denied the German government um, tax revenue. He adopted a new currency, the Rentenmark, which was worth one trillion of the old Weimar German marks. Uh, you know, so he just had a new currency that was easier to maintain. In other words, you no longer had to go down to the uh, to the grocery store with your money in a wheelbarrow and come back with a small loaf of bread. You know. He crushed Hitler's push, this guy Streisman did, in any communist uprisings. In 1924, the Weimar Republic agreed to what is called the Dawes Plan. It flavored the Dawes Plan, and is on your test, Mr. Onghouse, favored lower annual payments and allowed them, those payments, to vary according to the fortunes of the German economy. So they could go up. Could go down, the payments could. The last French troops pulled out of the Ruhr. In 1925, the Social Democratic Republican president, Frederick Ebert, died, pardon me, and was replaced by Paul von Hindenburg, another World War I general who was a conservative and in favor of restoring the monarchy. The new political and economic stability, though, meant that foreign capital, foreign investment money, now flowed back into Germ the German economy more freely. Employment in Germany rose. In the steel and chemical industries, large combines spread. The prosperity helped broaden appreciation and acceptance of the Weimar Republic. In other words, during the middle part of the 20s, the Weimar Republic was making a nice recovery. In foreign affairs, Streisman was conciliatory with Germany's former enemies. And that policy worked. He fulfilled the provision of Paris' settlement and even tried to revise them. He aimed to recover, this is Stresemann now, not Adolf Hitler, German territories in Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Austria through diplomacy. Now, another famous treaty this time, very important, is on your test, Mr. Stalinghouse, was the Locarno Treaty. It came from the following. The diplomats were Aristotle Briand of France, Austin Chamberlain of Britain, uh, as well as Stresemann of Germany. France and Germany both accepted the western frontier of Germany as legitimate. In other words, the Rhine River, which gave France the Alsace-Lorraine. France now owns, but still owns, by the way. France agreed to German membership in the League of Nations, and France strengthened its ties with the Little Entente, the little alliance that surrounded Germany. And France agreed to withdraw troops from the Rhineland in 1930, five years before they agreed. Locarno, the treaty, pleased everyone. Germany was glad to have achieved respectability and a guarantee against another. Ruhr occupation by the French, as well as to have the possibility of revision of the borders in the east. So Germany said, okay, all right, so France, you get to keep the Alsace Lorraine, but maybe we can take back that territory in the east 
that we lost. Going to have to get the map, Mr. Arlinghouse. Too many people are scratching their heads back, Mr. Arlinghouse. So what I wanted to show you is this. See, so in the Locarno Treaty, Germany said, okay, France, you get to keep this. Okay, this is where the Rhine River runs, and you get to keep this. But, Germany said, perhaps we can negotiate. And because you got to remember that lots and lots and lots and lots of Germans lived here. And the Germans wanted this territory back. And so there was a possibility, they could, Locarno left the possibility open, that they could negotiate getting this German territory, particularly German territory, here in Poland back. And now, back to it, shall we? The Locarno Treaty Agreements brought a new spirit of hope to Europe. Chamberlain, Neville Chamberlain, and Dawes received the Nobel Peace Prize, as did Streisman. This was carried further when Japan, the United States, and the Locarno states, meaning Germany, France, Britain, accepted the Calabrian Pact. The Calabrian Pact, which is in your terms, was a treaty that simply renounced war as an instrument of foreign policy. I mean, think of that. They said war is a bad thing. It's amazing what those people come up with. War is a bad thing. All right. The joy and optimism, however, were unjustified as the Germans primarily still did not accept the eastern borders of their country under the Locarno Agreements. The British said, however, that they would not fight to preserve the Polish corridor. Germany also continued clandestine military connections with the Soviet Union. You say, what does that mean? It means that the Germans In Germany, most people thought Locarno was just an extension of the Versailles Treaty, and therefore, and therefore, they were not happy with it. And the Dawes Plan expired. In 1929, it was replaced by the Young Plan. Name for American businessman Owen D. Young. This lowered this plan lowered reparation payments. I should write German reparation payments. Put a limit on how long those payments had to be made, and also removed Germany entirely from outside intervention and control. Now catch this, Mr. Arlinghouse. A major war, meaning World War II. was not inevitable. German leaders would press for change, but leaders like Stresemann would not uh, resort to all-out war. Europe, aided by American loans, were, was actually headed for prosperity. Continual prosperity would have won loyalty for the, from the Germans for the Weimar Republic. But what happens? The Great Depression. The Great Depression changed all that. Yeah. What was the cause of World War II? Answer, Great Depression. Okay. So, Mr. Arlinghouse, we're going to end here. Uh, I already have another test made. I'm not sure when I will have it, but uh, from now on, Mr. Arlinghouse, our tests are 
my test, I'm not going to have tests during class time. We'll have them on weekends via Canvas because Mr. Arlinghouse, uh, today is April the 2nd and the AP exam is May the 7th. We have one week of spring break somewhere in between the next five weeks. So that means we have four weeks to cover mm, 80, 90 years. And they're very active 80, 90 years, as I'm sure you would agree. All right, so let's stop sharing. Thank you, Mr. Allinghouse.